Hello, fairies and fleece blankets. My name is TB Skyne, and sometimes characters matter. Most of the time, you watch a movie, read a book, play a game, and the characters range somewhere between fun and functional. Maybe they're interesting, maybe they're compelling, maybe they're just adequate vessels for moving a story forwards towards conclusion. Maybe afterwards you'll find and retweet a bit of fan art of one of them, or look up a trashy fanfic for a pairing that seemed interesting. But in most cases, hey, a story comes and goes, and the characters that are in them stick around until something more interesting comes along to displace them. But... Sometimes we run into characters that matter to us. Sometimes they dig their fictional little nails into our metaphysical souls and fill voids in there that we didn't even know we had. And it's not always, you know, life-changing. It's not always a soul-shattering reckoning with the truth of the human condition. Sometimes it's just that something about them stuck to you. Something about this character got into your head and you keep thinking about them every so often. You can't forget them, even if you try, because they just so happened to fit an empty space in the jigsaw puzzle that is you. And I'm curious about those kinds of characters, the fixations that we have with them. What is it that catches on to us, that makes this character stick to me when that same character might slide right off so many other people? I have a list of characters that have hooked me, of course, and I could talk about them for hours, but I'm curious. Talking about characters I already know and love, well, that might be fun for you, but I'm not gonna learn anything. No, if I want to sate my curiosity, I think I'm gonna have to ask around. So I did, and I got some fascinating answers. Welcome to an essay collection about characters that matter. On the program today, we will discuss the boots of a Nintendo princess and a demon hunter who smiles. We will meet a demigod who's too loyal and a traitor who is too conflicted. You will hear about a trash man from a dumpster who wants to build a new body, and a whole cult of trash men from Mars who want to do that too. We will learn about the emotional resonance of scarabs and the inherent coolness of having chainsaws for hands. And, if you stick around to the end... I will tell you about a spiky-haired anime boy with a big sword who mattered to me a lot more than I ever thought he would. You can find links to all of the essayists featured in today's video down in the description below and in the pinned comment as well. And if you enjoy their essays, why not stop over at their channels to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, to start us off, here's a question I've never really considered. What's so peculiar about Princess Zelda's boots? Asriel has an interesting answer. Princess Zelda as she appears in Twilight Princess will be the coolest iteration forever, or until they make a playable Zelda. That's how I feel at least, and it doesn't help that she has fundamentally shaped me as a person since the moment I saw her as a child. Hi, I'm Azriel. You can find me most other places as Malakalico, and I'll be discussing Princess Zelda, her depiction in Twilight Princess, and how it stands out to me compared to her other incarnations. I'll also be going on a little tangent about gatekeeping. When it comes to Zelda's depiction throughout the franchise, she follows a sort of pattern. So regardless of the art style or what role she's playing, she's still recognizable as herself. As a base, we're always working with a pale-skinned, long-haired elf lady. Typically, she has a floor-length dress, her overall silhouette kept very slim, which gives her an air of refined elegance. Rather than a crown or tiara that sits atop her head, she has a circlet. Circlets are generally more heavily associated with fantasy, specifically elven aesthetics, that'll alone could explain the choice of accessory, but I also believe it highlights Zelda representing wisdom. Her circlet decorates her forehead, where her brain is. As for her appearance in Twilight Princess, she does break a few rules. In every one of her iterations, Zelda has blonde hair and a pink dress, which makes her appear cute and bubbly. Twilight Princess has an overall darker aesthetic and grim tone, reflected in Zelda having brown hair and a purple part to her dress, making her appear much colder and regal. That cold disposition is really reinforced by the fact that she doesn't really smile. Overall, she's a very elegant, distant princess which contrasts heavily with her boots. You don't really get to see them until, spoiler I guess, you fight her. This design choice brings her down to earth, showing that she cares very little for the glamour of being a princess, and alludes to the fact that behind the title is a pragmatist. That's what the contrast tells me, and I'm inclined to believe that it's deliberate, because you never get to see that detail until she's levitating, so she didn't need to have practical boots. This singular detail had me so insanely obsessed at age 10 that I still think about it to this day. 
Twilight Princess Zelda isn't revolutionary. She's still a damsel in distress, spending most of her in-game time sitting helpless in a tower. So really, a conventionally pretty princess design is a perfectly good way to depict her. That said, she's not completely devoid of agency. She gives Link guidance, heals Midna, and once you free her from being puppeteered, shoots Ganondorf from horseback with a bow and arrow. Not yet the protagonist of her own franchise, but it's pretty neat, especially considering she is rarely allowed to do anything as herself. I'm referring to she Tetra, and that time she was more often than not a suit of armor and spirit tracks. Bringing it back to my favorite detail about her, the boots, they offer her that bit of depth, a small hint at her drive. Honestly, if she were allowed to, she probably would have gone out and saved Hyrule herself. When I saw the prompt for the collaboration project, Twilight Princess Zelda was the very first character to come to mind. That said, I waited a really long time to actually commit to that choice, not that there were any other contenders. Throughout my life, I've seen plenty of character designs that make me feel something, good and bad. But Twilight Princess Zelda was very special to me. She was the one that sparked my interest in character design, my hobby and lifelong obsession. The reason why I almost skipped out on an opportunity to speak my mind on something so dear to me to a larger audience was because I never played the game. I found Zelda by playing Super Smash Bros. Brawl when I was a kid. I played for fun because it was something to do with my dad. I was in no way good at it. I did try to get into Zelda games later on, but that didn't really pan out. I couldn't finish Skyward Sword because it was difficult. It took me a year to finish Breath of the Wild because I was afraid of fighting the final boss of the game. If I had the chance to pick up Twilight Princess right now, I probably wouldn't. So it really had me wondering, am I allowed to like this character from media I don't engage with? Do I have anything of value to say? if I'm not a quote-unquote real gamer? The answer is yes, evidently. I luckily managed to land on that conclusion just in time to apply for the collaboration and get accepted. So it really got me examining how people gatekeep the media they consume, specifically gamers in this context. With the internet, we don't need to play a game to experience it. It may be a shame not to play a game for yourself, but what's worse is preventing yourself from resonating with a creative project. Not having the time, money, or gaming skills shouldn't prevent you from enjoying the style, themes, characters, or story presented by a game. The people who exclude non-gamers might not even care about those things, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just goes to show how different engagement can look from person to person. It's not fair to say there is a correct or more valid way to engage with a piece of media. I am not exaggerating when I say Twilight Princess Zelda changed my life. Is that suddenly not true just because I couldn't play the game itself? Anyway, regardless of what you think about the way we consume media or the Zelda franchise, I hope you enjoyed hearing me share why exactly Princess Zelda from Twilight Princess is my all-time favorite character design. I have other videos on character design and storytelling, albeit not many, so consider checking out my channel if you want to hear more from me. If you don't care about that but like my art, you can check out my Instagram, Tumblr, and Twitter. Also, maybe commission me. Please, thank you. All of this from a sensible pair of boots. It's amazing how the little things can shift your perception like that, isn't it? And it is a classic character design trick. If you have one small detail that's incongruous, one piece of a costume that says something different from the rest of it, you can communicate huge amounts of character that way. And for the audience, those details can become powerful. They can change so much of how you relate to a character. Sticking with the subject of little things that have huge meaning, our next essayist has another example of this. A small design, which is just one in a crowd of a thousand, which nonetheless hooked into something special and important. Tamamushi University would like to tell you about a Pokemon. About the age of, I want to say maybe nine, maybe ten, I got a particular gift from my father that I still hold on to this day. It wasn't a game, or a phone, or anything really fancy by any means. It was this. A little scarab keychain. I'm pretty sure it was something that he just got from a gift or tourist shop, maybe when he was on a visit to Egypt. I'm not really sure, nor did I really care as a kid. This little bug amulet, as trivial as it may have looked, was, and still is, special to me. Egyptian mythology was always an important subject to read in my life, mostly thanks to my father being Egyptian 
and giving me these sort of random ancient Egypt-styled gifts. But it was always something that fascinated me, and made me feel like I was learning something about the place I owe half my nationality to, as silly as that is. However, as I grew older, I noticed a lot of trends in media that just irked me. Ancient Egypt is used a lot in media, but it's always just the same few things. Over and over. And while I love the representation of this history in popular culture, when it's done right, it feels almost downright wasteful to only reference things that are seen as the cool parts of Egyptian mythology, or of ancient Egyptian society. And then, Pokemon Scarlet and Pokemon Violet happened. And Ravska happened. And I have not fallen so instantly in love with the Pokemon design in so long. I love the way this thing is visually presented. The dung ball it had now formed into a celestial egg that it cradles protectively. The bright blues and purples that help sell its typing and otherworldly feel. The center pair of arms that are stark white that blend in to look like a mustache, but also look like wings. It's such a peculiar design, but one I can't help but love. Not only because Game Freak cared to represent a dung beetle correctly, but to also represent something in ancient Egyptian mythology and culture that is so important, yet rarely ever given the time of day. The symbolic use of the scarab spans nearly the full history of ancient Egypt. See, scarab, or dung beetles as they're known, are well known already for rolling a ball of dung around. But did you know that ball has an egg inside of it? That dung ball is essentially just a cradle, and when the egg hatches, the little baby larva digs out from inside. Observing how the infant scarab would be born from the earth, these beetles became a symbol of rebirth. See how that starts to connect to Rabska? Scarabs lay their eggs in dung balls they create, and roll them with their hind legs. Both of these real-life, biological behaviors are not only represented in Rabska's design, but are blended in perfectly with its mythological ties as well. Ancient Egyptians saw the dung beetle as a symbol of the sun as its dung ball rolls against the horizon. So of course Rabska not only references that with its egg, but also mimics the iconic symbol of the beetle in hieroglyphs. And the pose being flipped over? Makes perfect sense as that's how real dung beetles roll their actual eggs. Why else would Rabska be the syllables for scarab backwards? It's quite literally an iconic Egyptian scarab shown backwards, and it's such a clever and silly thing that I can't help but smile. Clever and silly probably explains why I love this little guy so much. It's just, well, it's just such a fun and silly little guy. It isn't some warrior dog like Lucario that mimics itself after Anubis. It isn't some eerie creepypasta like Sarcophagus, like Cofagrigus, nor really any sort of rule of cool, slick design of an Egyptian god or undead. It is a Pokemon that is inspired by something at the core of Egyptian history, and it is completely content not being cool. But that, I think is what makes them really cool to me. I look at Rabska, and I see a protective beetle parent with its young. I look at Rabska, and I see a mysterious cosmic entity that delicately floats without any anger or malice. I look at Rabska, and I see the little dung beetle on my keychain, and I know without a second thought how happy I am a character design like this exists in a series that means so much to me.
When we fall in love with a character, it's almost never just because of the character themselves. Almost invariably, the thing that makes us resonate with them is something within ourselves. Some element of who we are rings out with the familiarity we feel in them. Which can sometimes make protagonists of stories feel a bit hollow, because oftentimes they are written fairly nondescript, they are generically aspirational, as placeholders for the audience to self-insert into the fantasy. And while that can be great and a lot of fun, sometimes it leaves you missing something to resonate with, some compelling character trait, a personality, or perhaps a flaw. I'm gonna let Brian Lazaro explain. I think I was 11 or 12 years old when it happened. I was an avid reader at the time, and was always on the prowl for a new book in my school library to sink my teeth into. It was during one of these searches, on a bright spring day, that I found the story that would change my life forever. The first thing that caught my eye was, of course, the cover. It wasn't the classic cover of a boy standing in the ocean with his back to the reader, staring defiantly up at a stormy New York skyline. No, this cover was of a blue lightning bolt carved into a white background with Greek monsters emerging from the open space. I was already a fan of Greek mythology, so between that cover and the blurb on the inside flap, I knew I had to check this book out. I devoured that book in record time, and from then on, I was a fan of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. No! Go away! We don't talk about you! You don't exist! Please be good, please be good, please be good, please be good, please be good! Anyway... While other books in the same age range and genre can struggle to have their main characters stand out from the weird and eccentric cast of side characters they inevitably surround themselves with, I feel that Percy, the titular character of the series, is easily one of, if not the most, interesting character in his own series. You'd think that should be obvious when crafting a story, but it's surprising how many books like this at the time had very milquetoast heroes that the audience was meant to project their own personalities on. By contrast, Percy has a strong and defined personality that changed throughout the series and has influenced my own path to becoming a writer. Today, I'd like to examine that character and show how it has inspired me both as a person and a creator. And while I could go on about this subject for hours, I'll be keeping this brief for the collab with TB Skyen. But if you want more videos like this, let me know by leaving a like, a comment, and subscribing. Consider this your spoiler warning, by the way. I'm going to be getting into his development throughout the series, and I'll try to speak in broad terms, but if you want to go into the books blind, you should do so now, and come back once you're finished. I can guarantee you, you're going to have a good time. With that out of the way, let's get into... To begin describing Perseus Jackson's character, let's use a metaphor related to his lineage and his powers. Like the sea, he is, as a whole, calm and easygoing, full of color and life, a safe place. Yet also like the sea, there is a darkness in his depths, and a powerful fury should you threaten those he cares about. That is one of my favorite parts about Percy's character, and how it's portrayed in the books. Too often in the genre of middle grade fantasy at the time of the book's first release, protagonists were rarely allowed to feel righteous anger. If they did, they were almost always immediately punished for it, and shown that revenge is not the way. Rick Riordan said, screw that, turn your abusive parents into stone. Yes, this is an actual thing that happened to the books. And this righteous fury against injustice isn't framed as inherently bad. Scary if taken too far, sure, but not wrong. Instead of anger, there is something much more dangerous that Percy has to struggle with. Like everyone, Percy has a darker side to him, and like all Greek heroes, he has a fatal flaw. That fatal flaw? Loyalty. At first glance, that might not seem like a flaw. After all, loyalty is why we humans love dogs so much. But Riordan knew his Greek mythology well, and he knew how a seemingly positive trait could easily become a person's downfall. Percy's loyalty to his loved ones is what propels the plot of almost every book in the first series, and while it leads to him saving many, many people, it also allows his foes to manipulate his actions. Yet Percy learns throughout the series, 
not how to overcome his fatal flaw, but how to live with it. He doesn't become less loyal, but he learns when to be loyal. This, I feel, works wonderfully with the fact that Percy has ADHD and dyslexia. These are conditions that people in the real world struggle with on a daily basis, and are often told to just get over it, or try harder by those around them. But anyone who has these or similar issues knows that these aren't things you can just get over, or make go away by trying harder. One has to learn how to live with these parts of themselves, not fight against them. And I think Riordan shows that throughout the series by having Percy learn how to live with who he is as a person, rather than radically change to fit some ideal version of what it means to be a hero. This approach to characterization, while perhaps seeming obvious and basic at first glance, was a novel experience for me when I was young and struggling with my own undiagnosed issues I had no name for, and was struggling to live with. And, in its own strange way, that reassured me that, despite having flaws, I could still do good things and be an overall positive influence on the world around me. As for my writing, Percy and his books have definitely influenced how I've written all of my characters. It taught me to focus on making them full, three-dimensional people with personality traits that are neither fully positive nor fully negative, but can be either depending on context. It has also inspired me not just to become an author myself, but to show the diversity of people and their struggles in my writing to the best of my ability. It's a beautiful, colorful world that we live in, and everyone deserves to see all of its many facets. Sorry if this video was a bit all over the place and rambling. I had to cut a fair bit to fit the time limit. As I said before, I could go on for much longer about Percy and the world he inhabits. But let me know if this helped you appreciate his character more, or if it revealed something you hadn't noticed. Also, let me know what your favorite moment of the series was if you've read it. If you haven't read it, do so now! Lastly, I want to thank TB Skyen again for this opportunity. I'm a big fan of his channel, and hope to reach even a modicum of his subscriber count someday. If you'd like to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe over on my main channel, which you can find by searching my name, Brian Lazaro. For shorter videos, you can find me under the same name on TikTok, or you can follow me on Twitter at TheRailBrianL. Links for all of those should be in the description below. Flaws can be frustrating in characters, especially the tedious flaws like procrastination or insecurity. But if he didn't procrastinate and if he wasn't so terribly insecure, there'd be no reason to get invested in the story of Hamlet if Joel didn't do what he does at the end of The Last of Us. I don't think people would spend so much time thinking about him, no matter how well Pedro Pascal plays him. Flaws resonate, and they can resonate in many ways, and in fact sometimes flaws can be the grounding element that helps justify ideas and decisions that should, by right, really be kind of stupid. I'll let Sefer explain to you what I mean. Show, don't tell. That is the first thing I learned as a writer. As someone who's chosen this godforsaken career path, I have been instilled with a cynicism of what is and what is not art. And when you start learning how to create art as a profession, you learn how to write within the rules, how to color within the lines, and how to do art correctly. Hey there, Skyen. I know you typically talk about video game characters here on this channel, but for this video, I wanted to review someone from an anime slash manga that I very much enjoy, and that is Denji, aka Chainsaw Man, from Chainsaw Man. See, when I saw the cover art in the first volume of the Chainsaw Man manga, I thought to myself, that looks like the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I want to read it. And now that I've finished the manga and also finished the first season of the anime, I can confidently say that it is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I love it. Here's the conundrum with Denji from Chainsaw Man. No one with a sound mind and body and a straight face can say that this is not objectively silly. 
But the problem is, is that he's also sick as hell. Denji is simultaneously the silliest design ever created by man, and also the coolest power fantasy that has ever existed. See, but that's precisely what I believe mangaka Tatsuki Fujimoto was going for when he created Denji and Chainsaw Man's design. He wanted the spikiest looking, evilest looking, scariest looking, most testosterone riddled dude you've ever seen in your life. And he got it. He got it in one. Everyone else can pack it up and go home because he created the man with the most testosterone ever. Period. If this guy was made in America, he would be on every Home Depot commercial telling me that my uncalloused hands look like I've never seen a hard day's work in my life. Let's ignore the chainsaws on his head and arms for a second and look at what the clothes he's wearing are. He's wearing a disheveled, wrinkled white shirt on his black tie uniform with his sleeves rolled up and sneakers instead of dress shoes. He looks out of place, like he doesn't belong in this formal setting, yet he's been thrust into this formal setting regardless. He is out of place both in society and in the organization he works for, and I think that comes across perfectly in his character design. But why specifically does this resonate with me? Denji's clothes tell you that he is a fish out of water, something I think we can all relate to on some level. But as someone who grew up pretty lonely, I immediately latched on to Denji's character because of this. Like Denji, I spent a lot of my childhood feeling alone and alienated, and once I was able to be more social, I felt like I had to learn all these things that people already knew all at once. I felt like a stranger in a strange land, just like how Denji never fully fits into any setting. There was another aspect of this that also resonated with me, and that is the manly aspects of his character design. See, Denji's chainsaw demon form is dripping with masculinity. It is spiky, it is edgy, it is badass. It exemplifies a ton of characteristics that are deeply tied to masculinity. Even the chainsaw itself, it is a tool of manual labor for cutting down trees, something burly lumberjacks do in the woods. It is inherently masculine. What's interesting though is that Denji is not the most testosterone riddled, muscled up, Mr. Universe looking guy that the world has ever seen. He's a vitamin D deprived, antisocial gamer like you and me. I'll explain for the uninitiated. Denji is what happens when you take a less problematic version of Mowgli from the Jungle Book, stick him in Men in Black, and have his first experience with a woman be with Monica from Doki Doki Literature Club. As someone who's non-binary, I wrestled for a really long time with what masculinity means to me. I would switch back and forth between feeling on the outskirts of masculinity and removed from it altogether. My experience with gender was mostly trying to mold myself to it, not mold it to me. Yet, Denji effortlessly does something that took me years to fully understand. He simultaneously exists as something intrinsically masculine in his demon form, yet challenges what traditional masculinity looks like in his human form. This duality of masculinity is something that really rang true for me. I love when characters can challenge gender like this. Don't get me wrong, I love Dragon Ball Z as much as the next guy, but it warms my heart when masculinity doesn't have to be just loud and muscular. It can also be skinny and shy or any other form it wants to take. But let's now move on to the most eye-catching part of his design, which is the chainsaws coming out of his head and arms. This is something that only could exist and look cool in an animated medium. You try and put this in live action, it's not going to look as good in my opinion because you don't have the cartoonishness that you can get in an animated space. And that is, the goofiness factor is turned up to 11. As a kid, I used this goofiness in my own art without even realizing it. Every day in the third grade I would sit at my desk frantically scribbling on loose leaf paper and I was writing stories. I was drawing characters, I was writing dialogue, I was crafting, frankly, way too much exposition. The best part of it was that I had no idea what I was doing. I did it because it was fun, it was addicting to create worlds and stories no matter how outlandish they were. However, as I grew older and learned more about character creation from pursuing acting and writing as a career, I learned to believe that minimalism and subtlety takes precedence over a more in-your-face design. I taught myself to ignore the tendency for outlandishness and focus only on the bare essentials to convey an idea. If I wanted to create a chainsaw man as a kid, it would have probably looked something like Denji, outlandish and impractical, but fun and whimsical. Now, if I were tasked with creating a chainsaw man, I don't know how easy it would be for me to let go and create something like Denji. Denji's design is so over the top, it's so exacerbated, it's so goofy that it works, and we are pumping our fists in the air when those chainsaws come out, instead of going, it's a little too much. It's way too much. It's way too much, and we're here for it every second of the way. Denji is not dual-wielding chainsaws like he has two katanas in his hands, nor does he have wolverine claws with three chainsaws coming out. No, his entire arm is the chainsaw. His whole arm is the chainsaw. That is wildly impractical, but it's so cool. 
Similarly, his forehead has a protruding chainsaw. Again, the goofiest thing you could ever imagine. And if I made that design, I would look at myself and go, what the hell am I thinking? But again, again, it works. It works so well, and it could not exist in any other medium. My love for Denji's design has started a sort of unlearning of the jaded beliefs I hold of my own works, something that has profoundly changed the way I interact with my own art. Funnily enough, it makes me feel like another character in the show, Aki Hayakawa. Aki is very serious about his work and is at odds with Denji for a long time because he doesn't believe Denji takes anything seriously. But Aki learns through working with Denji how to loosen up and become more childlike. Likewise, Fujimoto's work has helped me realize that I shouldn't be so hypercritical about the subtle machinations of everything I create, and I should allow myself to engage in the reckless abandon I used to create silly characters as a child. It's going to take a while, and at times it feels like I'm teaching myself to write with my non-dominant hand, but I want to start listening to that childlike side of myself again. I want to have faith in myself and what I create and be willing to take it to the extreme and see what it remains. But it's hard, even scary at times, to put your authentic and unbridled creativity out into the world, and I have so much respect for Fujimoto for doing just that. I hope to be able to do the same one day. Tatsuki Fujimoto uses Chainsaw Man as a masterclass in when it is okay to lean too hard into a design. When it is okay to go a little bit too far with your design. When it is okay to get nuts to butts and just throw crap at the wall and see what sticks. Because he put everything into this design. He went way farther than anyone else would when they were creating a chainsaw related superhero. And it works so well. Thank you, Skyen, so much for the opportunity to be in this video. If you want to see more of me just yelling at a camera about things that I enjoy, bring it over to my channel on Zephyr Caulfield. Uh, thank you again, Skyen. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's a delicate balance to go way too far without, you know, going way too far. It's an instinct I think we all kind of have naturally as children, and it gets kicked out of us as we grow up. It's a good one to reconnect with, and honestly, maybe I should spend some time doing that. There's another fictional universe that connects with that vibe. The vibe of going way too far and doing way too much, but doing it in such a wholehearted way that you can't help but be charmed by it. It's another universe where people sometimes have chainsaws for arms, and it's also another universe where they use them to hunt demons. But for them, the relationship to the machine means something a little bit different, and it resonates in a very different way. Chalky Prophet has an essay about why. From the moment I understood the weakness of my flesh, it disgusted me. I craved the strength and certainty of steel. I aspired to the purity of the blessed machine. Your kind cling to your flesh, as if it will not decay and fail you. One day, the crude biomass that you call the temple will wither, and you will beg my kind to save you. But I am already saved. You've probably seen this video or heard this audio before in meme form, and some of you maybe even know the faction it represents. Hi, I'm Chucky Prophet. These are the Adeptus Mechanicus of Warhammer 40k, and from the moment I first saw this video, I was hooked. So who are the Mechanicus exactly? Well, as even a passing encounter with the 40k universe has probably taught you, Warhammer lore is big. Very big. And since this is supposed to be a short video, we don't have time for the dozens of hours it would take to explain into detail. TLDR though, the psychic superhuman known as the Emperor of Mankind spent thousands of years on a great crusade, building a near unstoppable human empire. But just as it reached the very peak of its power and glory, a massive cataclysm occurred that cut off every planet in the Imperium from the others, both in terms of communication and trade. Mars, a central seat of power in the Imperium, fell into civil war, and millennia worth of technological progress was lost. From the ashes of this civil war, though, arose the Mechanicus, a technophile cult who were religiously obsessed with technology 
in all its forms, from pistols to nuclear warheads, they treat it all as inherently divine, for their machine god dwells within all technology. They now primarily function as both weapons providers and researchers for the Imperium, the only thing keeping the few ancient relics of technology that sustain the Imperium working. Yet, because of their religious zealotry, most of the knowledge that they should be recording is lost, discarded as heresy against the machine god. It's this specific mix of technological and religious aspects that originally drew me to them as a faction. Both halves are presented in this beautifully grim, dark, and over-the-top way that I can't get enough of. Every weapon is anointed with sacred oil and coal before being shipped away, regardless of their importance, and the iconic cog battle axes that somehow act as both symbols of the Mechanicum and as actual functional weapons are just extremely cool to me. Then there's the more scientific elements, like the skyscraper-sized mechs they maintain through their millennia of ancient knowledge, but whose numbers dwindle as the battles to protect the Imperium grew increasingly fierce. That's something I adore about the Warhammer setting in general, but I think the Mechanicus represent it best. I love the idea that everything in the Imperium is finite. They may win battles, but each one costs centuries worth of people and knowledge, and that doesn't just come back overnight. Because of this, the Mechanicum's desperate struggle to maintain those few scraps of knowledge they do have is deeply fascinating and kind of moving to me in a way. Beyond this though, I love all their deep ideological conflicts and hypocrisies, the kind only a bizarre setting like 40k could pull off without feeling overwritten. For example, there's a deep schism between the ambitious scientific sect and the conservative religious side of the Mechanicus. The more scientific tech priests want to see humanity's knowledge enriched through the collection of alien artifacts, and the religious side believes that technology not made by human hands can only bring corruption. These opposing dogmas are kept in check because they both hold each other back in terms of progress, but they also stop each other from devolving too far in an uneasy balance. They're also, as you probably guessed, dominated by themes of transhumanism. Mechanicus Doctrine states that the human body is nothing but a poorly crafted machine that requires upgrades to continue to function. These upgrades range from removal of limbs in exchange for mechanical tendrils to the full excision of any human emotion at all. They even speak and sing psalms and binary code, which they believe to be the pure tongue of the machine. I've always found explorations of humanity versus the mechanical incredibly fascinating when handled correctly, and I think those themes are represented beautifully by the Mechanicus. Specifically because it's a seemingly ridiculous setting like Warhammer, the exploration of themes like these can be cranked up to 11 without seeming out of place. Like how it's regularly demonstrated that while the Mechanicus have managed to cast off most of the outward aspects of humanity, their arrogance still drives them to poke at powers far beyond their understanding, often with apocalyptic results. There's several Warhammer games that exist purely because of Mechanicus Skullduggery. Their defiance in standing up against these threats, though, makes me love them even more. Another universal part of Warhammer I love is the idea of normal humans going up against the ancient horrors and arcane deities of this universe, with nothing but sheer stubbornness and numbers keeping them going. So when my silly little tech priests awaken some millennia old godlike civilization, I'm always way too emotionally invested in watching them fight to the last. But beyond the interesting thematics, they're just an incredibly unique and fun faction in my opinion, and bring an immense amount to any story they're a part of, and the setting in general. Like how they canonically own the actual skull of Nikola Tesla, who died 40,000 years ago, and for some reason they use it like an EMP grenade. Why? Because it's silly and cool. That's why, and I love it, and I don't think there's another 40k faction that gets to quite Mechanicus levels of silly, and on top of all of the serious stuff, it's another reason why I love them. Now, there are two main predominant aesthetics that Warhammer factions tend to follow. There are the incredibly built, solid, highly exaggerated factions like the Space Marines and Sisters of Battle, which commonly come to mind when you think about Warhammer designs. Then there's the Geiger-esque designs of aliens like the Tyranids and Dark Eldar, which are creepy and awesome in equal measure. The Mechanicus, at least to me, stand apart from these two predominant forms by mixing together aspects of both and adding a healthy dose of gothic steampunk to the pot. Like a lot of people, I adore steampunk aesthetics in general, but Warhammer's unique grungy grim darkness elevates their design 
burn to levels of oh my god that's cool that I rarely feel. In terms of design they have some of the most unique units in the Warhammer universe. We've got mechanical hounds ridden by steampunk cowboys, irradiated soldiers with radiation guns, terrifying gas masked assassins, and something stolen from a Da Vinci sketchbook. I've always loved the sheer variety of designs and design inspiration for k and the Mechanicus gets some of the best of that I think. As someone obsessed with history as well as picking apart the designs of things, all the historical design references and small details make me adore this faction even more, even though the majority of the details get lost when I paint. My favourite designs on their roster though belong to the tech priests themselves. They embody so much of what I love about the faction visually, with their perfect mix of bizarre implants, decrepit flesh, and the iconic red robe that holds it all together. Within this though, there's this fantastic variety, like the difference between the slender and imposing tech priest Domini, and the more out there designs like Belisarius Call. Then there's the Electro Priests, people who are so devoted to the Mechanicus they infuse themselves with incredible amounts of electricity and willingly charge into battle like living electric grenades. And that's without going into their weapons. I mentioned the axes earlier but their frontline troopers use these awesome Baroque muskets that make my monkey brain activate. In fact every weapon they use draws from the same bizarre mishmash of historical and sci-fi elements that they do and I absolutely love it. Then there's stuff like the Castellan robots, the most friend shaped things in the Warhammer universe, which take their orders by goddamn floppy disk. An ancient technology in this universe I remind you. Just there's so many parts of this faction that I genuinely love, I could go on for hours, but we don't have time for that. However I will finish off by saying that if anything about this faction interests you, go listen to the Mechanicus Game OS team, just trust me you won't be disappointed. So yeah. That's the Mechanicus, and that's, I hope, a good summary of why I like them so much. They're probably one of my favourite factions in anything, and will remain that way until I'm done funneling all my student money into the Funny Plastic Army Fund. Speaking of the Funny Plastic Army Fund, if you like this little video for whatever reason, please check out my channel. Currently I've got a video up reviewing Devil May Cry 1, and I have plans to release more content very soon in the near future. Regardless, thank you for watching, I've been Chucky Prophet. goodbye. The Mechanicus are a fascinating faction in 40k, specifically because of the ways they are in tension with the Imperium. They are curious in a culture that venerates ignorance. They strive for self-improvement in a society whose only objective is desperately holding on to a stale status quo. Staying on the subject, though, of finding your body insufficient and wanting to augment it so as to get closer to the divine, well, you're never going to guess where this is going, so I think I'll just let Ace explain. So, the diary said that Alphys made them a robot body that would finally let them feel like themselves, meaning that he's- You've got mail! Hold up, I need to close this ad. What is a man but a miserable pile of secrets? If masculinity is about rising to challenges, time and time again, with the expectation that you must overcome them alone, then trans men are the most masculine, and, following this logic, Spantum G. Spantum is the most transmasculine. He needs no introduction as the spam email guy from Deltarune, and he's very trans. I mean, he lays eggs. I don't make the rules. That's a man of the trans behavior. It's on this list I made just now. Guess I do make the rules. Yay me! Just like how we make ourselves and our indulgent spanton interpretations. He's a bird. He's a plane. Yes, he's any animal or inanimate object you want. Customizable like identity. He may not be an all-powerful, all-loving god, but he does love all genders, an MLM in both ways. He wants to be bigger because he's less than five feet tall. If he's more than that, I'd, I'd feel threatened for reasons. Regardless, he achieves a new, towering body with a deeper voice. His dream body. His own worst invention. Was it worth it? After all that wishing, praying, you end up a mismatch work in progress between the synthetic and the divine. Red rust speckled 
on an angel. Real boys don't have that on their chests. You were trying to be like all the other guys. A real man. Not this. It's about the desire to fit this ideal of success and agency that you've been denied. It's what all men aspire for, even if no one can actually live up to it. In spite of this, you want it all the more because obviously you're just doing it wrong. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and put on your binder, boy. But maybe you can be something else. Something more. When a caterpillar is inside its cocoon to become a butterfly, it's slime. And when you're trans, you're in a constant state of metamorphosis. You're not the silly worm everyone knew you as, nor are you the serious beauty you hoped to be, but a goopy gender soup with ingredients of both. And I know from college living that you can end up making soup that isn't very appetizing. But people assigned female at birth are meant to be appealing consumables. Ugliness is weaponized against those assigned female at birth for every part of their bodies. And taking testosterone isn't pretty. Patchy stubble, male pattern baldness, and plenty of acne. Gross in ways that are barely tolerated in cis men. And I love it. I look at my body and can't wait to see what it does next in the upcoming months and years. Oh, I'm damaging my girlish figure. Go advertise your all-natural skincare and anti-aging diet to a dumpster. All of my oddities adorn me into adulthood. They're comforting. Freeing. One day, I'm going to be a schlubby middle-aged baby doll too. That's how I'm taking control of the narrative. Well, I ended up talking a bit about myself, but isn't self-aggrandizing true to the character? Plus, scammers like him love personal information. Yummy. Now, I'm not going to spam all of my socials, just a website that I made that hosts my art, content, labor, including a link to my channel. Please do check out the video of Whomever is After Me. Bye. If you'll permit me a moment of being a little honest and vulnerable, I know, but we'll get through it. I have mostly dressed in t-shirts, jeans, and hoodies for most of my life. Not just because it is the official uniform of gamers, TM, but because I internalized the idea early that if my body isn't perfect, if it isn't desirable to the cultural standard, then trying to decorate it is an act of cringeworthy hubris for which I should feel ashamed. And I have felt a lot happier and more at ease in my skin ever since I started to deconstruct that particular notion. Speaking of feeling unhappy in your skin and wearing a pretty costume on top of something you hate, it's cliché to have the hero and the villain be mirror opposites of one another and therefore be enemies destined to clash in an epic confrontation. It's a cliché because it works, but what happens when those differences are what makes you friends instead? I'll let moments in media explain. I fell in love with video games when I was very young. They were a pragmatic solution to a problem that permeated my entire life. Find something to do. I'm an only child, and my parents both worked on schedules that left me with a lot of alone time and even more idle time hanging out at their workplaces while they were busy. So finding something to do was paramount. My solutions ranged from sleeping, to reading, to exploring the less traveled areas of wherever I found myself, to video games. I quickly and accidentally realized that JRPGs were going to be my bread and butter by dint of the fact that they were prevalent on handheld devices, a necessary starting point given I was rarely in a place that offered space for home consoles, and that they took up a lot of time. I started with Pokemon, moved to Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, and eventually to the Tales games and whatever one-offs I encountered. And then in 2010, I caught wind of a new game that was coming out. Apparently it was an updated version of this game that had been out for a while on the PS2, and people really liked it. It was like a normal JRPG, but dark and edgy. By then, I had been playing JRPGs for over half a decade, and the idea of a darker and edgier one was beyond appealing to me. That game was Persona 3 Portable, and it is, to this day, over a decade later, one of my favorite games of all time. 
It was all the things I loved about JRPGs, but with a deep and complex story that was closer to my favorite books than to other games. And it had a whole extra game attached to it where you lived a day-to-day -day life and explore an actual town and talk to people and learn all about their personal struggles. From then on, the Persona series was always on my radar, even as I started to get into mainstream console games and JRPGs fell a bit to the wayside. So obviously, when Persona 5 finally came out in 2016, after its long and mildly troubled development, I was excited. And that excitement wasn't misplaced, because Persona 5 is right up there with Persona 3 Portable on my favorite games list. There are many things to praise Persona 5 for, but there's one that holds a special place in my heart. The character Goro Akechi. Persona 5 operates similarly to Persona 3 in that it utilizes a suite of social simulation mechanics to augment the classic JRPG formula. And, also like Persona 3, Persona 5 received an updated release called Persona 5 Royal that added a substantial amount of new content. However, I'm going to mostly ignore the characterization of Akechi in Royal's new content, and if you want to know why, you can watch the companion piece to this video on my channel called Persona 5 Royal is a sequel to itself. Persona 5 follows the exploits of a group of Japanese teenagers who call themselves the Phantom Thieves, as they reform society by sneaking into the minds of corrupt adults and fighting mental apparitions of their inner demons, thus destroying their distorted desires. To facilitate their fights, they utilize the titular Personas, a magical other self that takes the form of a highly personalized version of a pop-cultural figure with magical powers. When the group's exploits become known to the public, teenage detective Goro Akechi vows to catch the thieves and arrest them for their crimes. Akechi eventually joins the Phantom Thieves in an uneasy alliance to take down a bigger criminal before betraying them for his own ends. You'll learn a decent amount about Akechi from just playing the game, but by spending time with Akechi using the social sim mechanics, you get a deep look at his character and are granted insight into his motives. When Akechi first meets the player character, he employs a dialectical metaphor in the form of a paraphrased quote he attributes to Hegel to initiate a social link. From then on, hanging out with Akechi sees the two of you sparring both verbally and physically over everything from jazz music to billiards to how long you can sit in a bathhouse to your competency at wielding your personas. It becomes clear that Akechi is a very lonely person who was abandoned by his father and lost his mother at a young age. He doesn't have any close friends outside of the player character, and he's so unused to the feeling of being emotionally honest with someone that he mistakenly identifies it as hatred. His affinity for the player character is that of a kindred spirit, but he's spent so long on his own that he denies himself the happiness of companionship in favor of seeing his plan of mutually assured destruction through to the end. Everything Akechi does and says is meticulously crafted to make him look smart and handsome and appealing, but it's all a charade. From the fact that the cases he solves as a detective are all crimes he himself committed, to the fact that the quote he paraphrases wasn't even said by the philosopher he attributes it to. He covers himself in facade after facade, and when those are stripped away and his core personality is revealed, it turns out he actually is all the things he tries so hard to be. He's intelligent, diligent, clever, athletic, charismatic, but he still hides behind his public persona of the detective prince, and my heart breaks for him every time I see his emotional breakdown. Because I get it. I get needing to seem not just perfect, but better than perfect. I get needing to seem so much better than everyone else around you, and I get the insecurity that impulse stems from. And I think that's why Akechi's quieter moments with the player hit me so hard. Watching him meet and spend time with a person who's the perfect foil for his insecurities, someone who doesn't let the people around him dictate his personal worth, but is also a match for Akechi in the traits he values so highly, is a cathartic experience. I, as the player, get to reach out to a character who's caught in an unhealthy mental state that I've personally experienced, and I get to help him through it. And all of that emotional and psychological depth is amplified by an amazing voice acting performance by Robbie Damon. Damon does an excellent job at capturing both the calm and collected surface of Akechi, as well as the unhinged rage that occasionally breaks through the veneer of stability. But the standout for me is the handful of times when Akechi is barely managing to control that maniacal side of himself. It's chilling to hear that restrained emotion, and Damon's delivery makes those moments memorable in a way they otherwise wouldn't be. But that's just the social simulation half of Akechi's characterization. So now let's look at the JRPG half. I've always loved the concept of ludonarrative, the way a game's systems, mechanics, and other gameplay elements influence the story being told. It's a form of storytelling that's both unique to and intrinsic to video games, so it can often make or break games with a strong focus on story. When it comes to JRPGs, the biggest form of ludonarrative characterization comes from the role the character plays in combat. Persona 5 has a strong focus on the aesthetics of combat, as is appropriate for a game so steeped in Jungian terminology, so I'll expand the definition of combat role to include a few things that aren't strictly mechanical, but do have a large and direct impact on combat aesthetics. Combat in Persona 5 can be engaged in two ways, via the person and via the persona. The person has a melee weapon and a ranged weapon, and the persona has a variety of magic that can be used for offense, defense, healing, or utility. Each person has a unique set of weapons, and each person's persona has a unique skill set they learn, both of which play into the main conceit of Persona 5's combat. It happens inside a literal version of the collective unconscious. Basically, the weapons and persona are individualized because they're what the individual visualizes on an instinctual level when they need to fight. So what weapons does a catchy manifest from his subconscious? a lightsaber, and a laser pistol. The rest of the characters use realistic weapons like knives and axes and katanas, or revolvers and shotguns and grenade launchers. But not Akechi. 
because in his heart he never let go of his childhood dream of being a superhero. And that extends to the first of his two personas, Robin Hood. Akechi's Robin Hood has the hallmark design elements of Golden Age superheroes, the inflatable muscle suit, the bright colors, and the stylized initial serving as an insignia on his chest, while also using the fringe, epaulets, and bow to remind you of his origin as a medieval English outlaw. Akechi's inner self, when manifested as a character from pop culture, is this specific idea of Robin Hood, a shining paragon of a hero who defeats those in power and simultaneously saves those without. And in combat, that equates to learning both light and dark magic skills, as well as non-elemental magic, making him able to always damage a foe without hitting a resistance. However, he only gets one skill that directly affects an ally, and it's one that revives them from being knocked out. Add on to that his capstone skill, which debuffs every stat for one enemy, and you're left with a character that has great versatility in attacking, but can only help teammates when they're at their lowest. So if Robin Hood is the charming detective prince who can solve any case and has the best grades in his class, what about all that anger and insecurity that Akechi hides away from the world? Well, that side of himself manifests as his second persona, Loki. Loki is a mainstay of the Persona franchise, and in the other modern games in the series, he's the highest or second highest level Persona of the full Arcana, the Arcana that symbolizes the player character. He's a powerful mid to late game Persona that has a unique skill of some sort. But in Persona 5, Loki is conspicuously absent all the way until Akechi's third act breakdown, where it's revealed that one of the iconic Personas associated directly with the player character is instead Akechi's. And his design reflects that. The other Loki designs are fine, if a little boring, but Akechi's is something special. The black and white stripes covering his body obscure his form, his eyes are almost hidden under the massive horns protruding from his forehead, and the long braided hair that slowly bleeds into red as it reaches his feet serves as a mirror to his glowing red sword with its black handle. This is the trickster god filtered through blind anger, and it's the perfect fit for Akechi's other self. Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor, but Loki does what he wants when he wants, whether it's good for him or not. He's the blood brother of Odin, but he's also the father of the monsters who began Ragnarok. In the same way, Akechi is devoted utterly to his goal, even though he knows the consequences for him will be dire, and his closest personal relationship is with the protagonist, but he also works against the Phantom Thieves for his own ends. The rest of the party also have two personas, with their original persona transforming into a new one after coming to a revelation about themselves at the end of their social link. But not so for Akechi. He has two personas from the beginning, and they're completely separate as he's torn between two conflicting self-images. The Persona series is the pinnacle of what I love about video games. Touching stories, philosophical musings, audio and visual spectacle, and engaging interactive systems all working in concert to elevate the combined product to a work of art. And Goro Akechi is that in miniature. When Akechi introduces himself to the player, he paraphrases a quote that's commonly misattributed to Hegel. Akechi uses the quote to position himself and the player as two parts of the same metaphorical whole, which, when combined, will lead to advancement. But the quote is also reflective of Akechi himself. His thesis, as represented by Robin Hood, is that he can be a heroic figure who betters the world around him while maintaining a simple system of morality. His antithesis, as represented by Loki, is that he'll always be seen as an outsider, and the path towards happiness is one that positions himself as the only important figure in the world, leading to a nearly nihilistic attitude. But Akechi's truth is never reached, and he dies before he can reconcile his inner dialectic. Akechi is a tragic character of Shakespearean proportions. And like the best tragedies, even though I already know the ending, I still hold out hope with every new playthrough of Persona 5 that maybe, this time, things will turn out better for him. The thing about good tragedy is that it's often based on hope. A story isn't compelling just because things fall apart, it's compelling because you can see all the ways in which tragedy could have been avoided. If only Akechi had been able to reach out to his friends in those last minutes. If only the Titanic had thrown its rudder a second earlier. If only Orpheus, this time, would keep his nerve just for that last stretch of the journey. A good tragedy not only hits you with the hurt of how things went wrong, but it fills you with the sense of hope that they might have been different. Hope is a precious feeling. It's one that I think is actually necessary to live. And sometimes hope, even in the face of tragedy and hardship, is a gift that we can give to the people that we care about. I'm going to let Danny Mata explain. Hi, hello, I'm Danny Mata. You may know me as the little baby b boy who keeps making videos about how superheroes and children's movies scare him. Or, if you're an anime fan, you may know me as the guy who screams about anime boys falling in love over their affinity for skateboarding. Regardless, I have been summoned by a creator much better than I to talk about a character and media that impacted me. So gather around, everyone, because today, I'm going to tell you about how this ketchup-stained macaroni penguin taught me the true meaning of strength. Now, when you think of strength, what comes to your mind? If you're an anime fan, you might have a few definitions. Maybe it means training your body to its absolute limits, pushing yourself beyond what you thought you were capable of. Maybe it means fighting to protect those you love, leaning on the connections you've made to carry you through your struggles. Well, in shonen anime, strength is often determined by who wins a fight. It's a pretty simple concept. You win the fight, 
you're the strongest. Yeah, you know what? That's pretty good. It's easy to understand. I can get behind that. But Demon Slayer subverts this concept with one of the most memorable, well-written, and inspiring characters I've ever seen. That character is Rengoku. You see, Rengoku isn't one of the strongest characters in anime history because of the battles he wins. He's strong because of the battle he loses. Rengoku is introduced as the shining example of a demon slayer at their full potential. We see him slaughter demons with ease, an unwavering smile of confidence plastered across his face. Our main cast of characters start to look up to him as an older brother figure. They've had to rely on themselves for so long, and now they finally have someone they can lean on for guidance. Everybody respects him, and even the audience is like, hey, you know what, this fuzzy Ronald McDonald guy is all right. He seems invincible, both in terms of his physical strength and his convictions. But then we get a look into his past, and what once appeared to be natural invincibility starts to look a lot more like forged armor. His father is an abusive drunk who treats Rengoku's achievements as embarrassments towards their family. We learn that his unwavering smile isn't a sign of his own confidence, but a mask he's developed. Or rather, not a mask but a shield. A shield he uses not for himself, but for his younger brother, to protect him from their father's abuse. It's here that we get our first glimpse at what truly defines Rengoku's strength. He enters his father's bedroom, has his pride belittled, and still walks out with a smile. But that smile isn't for his own benefit, it's for his brother. It's so that his brother knows that no matter how bad things seem, they aren't. How could they be? Just look at that smile. Fast forward to the end of the film and Rengoku and company are confronted by a demon far stronger than any we've encountered before. They clash, and though Rengoku puts up a hell of a fight, he's no match for the demon's insane healing abilities. Finally, in respect towards Rengoku's amazing fighting spirit, the foe offers to turn Rengoku into a demon, making him immortal as well as giving him an insatiable lust for human blood. And honestly, not a bad deal. Not a bad deal, snacking on a few people for immortality? I'd take that deal. I'd take that deal nine times out of ten. But Rengoku refuses. He's wounded, inches from death, and this demon is no closer to being defeated than when their battle first began. He has a younger brother he needs to protect, and three new demon slayers who all look up to him. He has plenty of reasons to live, but that's exactly why he doesn't take the deal. He refuses because if he backs down on his convictions now, just to save his own life, all of those smiles he's given to lift people's spirits despite his own pain would be meaningless. It'd send the message to everyone who looks up to him that even this heroic beacon of confidence cannot survive against the demon's brutality and temptations. But if he fights and dies trying, he gives all those who idolize him something to fight for. He becomes an example to follow. That's exactly what he does. And that's exactly what he is. Sad stuff. Sad stuff, guys. Objectively, sad stuff. But this character arc didn't affect me so much because I'd miss Rengoku and didn't want to see him leave the cast. It affected me because Rengoku reminded me of someone. Someone selfless. Someone confident. Someone brave. Me! That's right, Danny Mata! I am become your new Jesus Christ! No, not me. My mom. Let me tell you a little something about my mom. My mom has struggled through cancer, depression, broken bones, poverty, homelessness, and every disease in the book outside of leprosy. My mom is a goddamn medical marvel. She doesn't even have most of her organs anymore. Once a year, I have to bring my mom to the hospital, and they return her to me with less mom. She's a freak- Oh, sorry, hold on one sec. Uh, yeah, hello? Yep. Oh. Oh, you just found out? Okay. Um, alright, well, uh, thanks for telling me. Yep. Bye. She just got leprosy! But despite all of that, despite her being a regular at both our local hospital and emergency room, she is no more hollow and no less full of life than I remember her being when I was a child. My mom worked the night shift at our local Planet Fitness from midnight to 6 a.m., and then worked at a college from 9 a.m. to 6. Then she'd come home and make a gigantic dinner for my sister and I, enough so that we'd have plenty of leftovers for the rest of the week. We'd hang out with her for about two hours, and then she'd go to bed around 8 so she wasn't too tired for her midnight night shift. If I were working that late and that long, I wouldn't want to talk to anybody. But at that Planet Fitness, she was famous. My mom made so many friends working that counter that when she got breast cancer, our fridge was always full of food from other people. 
People from the gym would come visit our house to check in on her, tell her that they missed seeing her there. It felt like the whole town knew her, like everyone was rooting for her to pull through. Patients at her hospital loved her because she'd always go into her chemo treatments wearing some sort of insane hat. My mom isn't someone who struggles with depression, someone who fears cancer returning, or someone with a myriad of other medical complications that threaten to keep her from experiencing life. Or at least, that's not the story her smile would tell you. It'd tell you she's someone who loves dancing, someone who follows along to Bob Ross tapes and hangs her art proudly on the walls. She went through so much, goes through so much, but wears a smile that could trick you into thinking the world were on the brink of peace. But now that I'm older and my mom sees me as a friend as well as a son, she opens up to me a little more. She tells me about how many times we almost lost our house, how hard it was working three jobs, how terrified she was of each and every doctor's appointment. And I can only imagine how hard it must have been to shoulder all of those fears and wear a smile the whole time just so she didn't worry others. That's why Rengoku's sacrifices resonated with me so much. Not just the sacrifice of giving his life, but the sacrifice of hiding his emotions for the sake of others. He didn't wear a smile to make himself feel better. He wore one to lift others up. With Rengoku's dying breath, he sent out a message. Set your heart ablaze, grit your teeth, and look straight ahead. Fight. Fight because your opponent doesn't think you will. Fight because your struggle means something to others. Fight because you'd want to see someone do the same for you. Rengoku dies, but he defeats the demon. The characters may not know it, and I'm sure they think Akaza's won, but he lost. Because in sacrificing himself, in fighting to the bitter end, Rengoku gave Tanjiro, Inosuke, and Zenitsu something to fight for. A reason to hunt down every last demon and save humanity from their plight. I remember sitting in the theater, watching Rengoku take his final breath, knowing he'd never get the satisfaction one gets from venting their pain to others. I remember watching him suffer for everyone but himself, an inspiration to all. I remember seeing all of that and thinking, I don't know if I'll ever be that strong but I know somebody who is. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, make sure you check out my other pages on YouTube. You can check out my main page where I make content like this. Hey, bitches and bros and non-binary hoes. Whom's hoes and non-binary excuse me? Or you could check out my second, smaller channel where I upload videos closer to the one you just watched here. Like this. January 25th, 2011. You're at school, and all of your friends are like, Yo, have you played Dead Space 2 yet? And you're like, No, my parents wouldn't buy it for me. EA keeps telling my mom she's gonna hate it. And they say swag. That's what's up. Because it's 2011. Thank you so much to TB Skyen for letting me take part in this awesome collaboration. And I hope you guys enjoy some of the content from the rest of these amazing creators. And I will see you all next time. <sighs> Yeah, I need to call my mom. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah, when you're a kid, the world does seem a lot simpler. It kind of has to in order for a kid to understand it. But as we grow up, we come to reckon with complexities. And we usually discover that the good that we remember was almost never an uncomplicated good. Simple things we take for granted take on new and sometimes deeper, sometimes darker meanings, and occasionally a simple pleasure that seemed so easy to understand back then reveals itself as something entirely more complicated. I think I'll give you an example of this myself. My first Final Fantasy game was Final Fantasy VII. I remember very clearly my friend popping the demo disc into his PS1 and loading it up. I really envied him, that PS1. And after being amazed by the state-of-the-art CGI intro and watching the train pull into the station at the reactor and turning seamlessly into a pre-rendered background, this chunky polygon puppet does a sick flip off the top and gets into a fight. Now, that was already cool, but what came next, that's what really blew my mind. Because, you see, the soldier enemies, they have machine guns, but my guy has a sword. He can cast spells and stuff. He has, like, magic. My nine-year-old mind was blown by this novelty. The idea of mixing fantasy aesthetics with sci-fi was an absolute marvel to me, and it was this instant fascination that compelled me. I knew I had to finish this game. I needed to play it. Being a Nintendo 64 kid, I had to borrow my friend's PS1 over weeks and weeks in order to try and finish it, and my strongest memories are of me and my friend obtaining the Bahamut Summon 
material for the first time and being absolutely mind blown by the cutscene triggered. When we finally discovered Knights of the Round, that became the subject of our constant discussion for weeks. And when I finally beat the game, you bet I could not shut up about One Winged Angel and Sephiroth's supernova attack. But you might notice that all the memories I'm describing are aesthetic. They're all about the visual experience of it, the coolness, the style. Almost none of those early memories are about the story or the characters. I've since replayed the game a million times and I can recite its story backwards in my sleep, but in my early memories, all I really understood about the story is that Sephiroth is the bad guy, there's a meteor, and then something something Shinra Company bad. English isn't my first language, so as a nine-year-old it was pretty tough to understand what was going on, especially given that the game has a fairly imperfect translation and some really mature themes that I wasn't ready to understand yet. But there is one part that I do remember, a part which has sat with me from the first time I ever played it. The protagonist of the game, Cloud, is a former military elite soldier who defects from Shinra and becomes a mercenary. And throughout much of the game, that's the part he plays. He and Sephiroth have unfinished business because he carries a grudge from the time that Sephiroth killed his family. Cloud as a character comes off, especially initially, as standoffish, cold, distant, unbothered, but if you're paying attention, you'll see cracks in that mask of his very early on. Eventually, Sephiroth confronts Cloud and casts doubt on his facade. He tells him he's not a real person, he's just a puppet, just a failed Sephiroth clone, and Cloud, unable to refute him, shatters under the pressure. He surrenders to Sephiroth's control and nearly dies, falling into the roiling, chaotic life stream. Cloud's sense of self turns out to be very terribly fragile because Sephiroth is in part right. He is only pretending to be someone. He is not a badass mercenary or an ex-soldier. As we learn in a series of flashbacks while his friend Tifa helps him reconstruct his traumatically fragmented memories, the real Cloud was a wimpy, bullied, insecure child who went away to become a soldier because he thought it would make a man out of him. He thought that if only he could be like the famous Sephiroth, then everyone would respect him. They'd all like him. They would all think more of him. He placed all his hopes of self-respect on this one achievement. But he never made it. He never became a real soldier. Just a nameless grunt trailing behind his friend Sack and behind Sephiroth. He becomes an NPC in someone else's cooler story. When a mission takes him back to his hometown, he's so ashamed that he hides his face and pretends not to even know his old friends. Sephiroth burns down Cloud's hometown, murders everyone in it, and nearly kills Cloud, and the trauma of that, on top of his shame, on top of weeks of scientific torture at the hands of Shinra, destroys him as a person. He hates himself for being too weak to save his hometown, too weak to stop Sephiroth, too weak to become a soldier, and too weak to save his friend Zack, who did everything to try and save him. When Tifa finds him, nearly catatonic in the slums of Midgar, his fragile mind desperately reaches for a coping mechanism, and he invents for himself a new persona, Cloud Strife, badass mercenary soldier. Clutching Zack's buster sword, he steals Zack's identity, literally. He merges his memories of who Zack was and what Zack did into himself and just pretends that that's him. He pretends because he desperately needs his childhood friend, Tifa, to see good in him that he can't see in himself. Eventually, with Tifa's help, Cloud pieces himself back together. He comes to understand what has happened to him and why he did what he did, and he comes to understand who he really is, and he embraces it. And it doesn't play out as a triumphant moment of transcendence. He's not overcoming all of his problems in a moment of profound insight. He just becomes conscious of them. He stops lying to himself about them. He apologizes to the party, to his friends for being dishonest, and he owns his weakness. He embraces it. It doesn't turn him into a confident hero to do that, but it does break him free of Sephiroth's control. Because what Sephiroth represents thematically isn't just a big scary villain who's gonna end the world, he also represents the idealized anime superhero self that Cloud thought he had to live up to in order to be worth anything. He is the man Cloud thought he had to be to be respected and to respect himself. 
I could go on for hours and hours about how Sephiroth represents poisonous forms of masculinity and how the fact that the military-industrial complex of Shinra uses him as a propaganda figure reflects the ways that the military is sold to young men and boys as a way to become a real man. I could go on about the interconnectedness of Final Fantasy VII's environmentalist themes with the imagery of Genova and Shinra both as parasites and ticks and how they both use Sephiroth as means to an end. I could go on about how Sephiroth himself is traumatized and broken because Sephiroth isn't even the real true villain of Final Fantasy VII, he's just another victim. We could talk about Jungian shadows and projection and how men are taught to internalize their shame and silence and loneliness. But that's all stuff I have realized later in life, with repeated analysis and careful playthroughs. I didn't understand any of that when I was nine. No, the reason Cloud Strife has stuck with me, the reason why he's important to me, is a lot simpler than that. It's because he was so cool with his big sword and his magic. It's because I named him after myself when the game gave me the prompt to do it. It's because I remember that cool guy with his cool sword, and I remember seeing him collapsed on the ground, ashamed and afraid, because he'd been telling everyone a big lie about how he really feels inside. That's what stuck with me. That's an image I have never been able to get out of my head. I didn't understand why back then, I just knew that something about this resonated somehow. Like, literally, it resonated. It made something vibrate inside of me in a way that I'm not sure I liked very much, to be honest, but I kept going back to it. Because, without getting into details, let's just say I have some experience of what it's like to project a fake and more confident, more macho self-image to cover up for a profound void of self-esteem. I know what it's like to need other people to think better of you because you can't think better of yourself. My first online screen name was Cloud Strife, and I used it in the first online communities I joined where I started for the first time to feel like I could actually be myself without always having to perform someone else. It was the name I used while I found some of my deepest and most important friendships, people who helped me piece together who I really am, people without whom I would not be here. And um, in Danish, the word for cloud is sky, S-K-Y. And in Danish grammar, the definite article goes on the end of the nouns. So, bridge is bo, and the bridge is bo en. Similarly, cloud is sky, and the cloud is sky en. My friends started calling me that, the cloud skyen, or as you might pronounce it, skyen. Final Fantasy VII isn't my favorite Final Fantasy game. That will always and forever be Final Fantasy IX. But I don't think there's a protagonist of any game that has ever mattered to me quite as much as Cloud Strife does. I needed a hero with a story like his back then, even if I didn't understand why or how much I did. Sometimes I find I still need him, and there is a certain comfort that I will always find in replaying Final Fantasy VII. And that's enough out of me, I think. It's also the end of our essays tonight. Have you had a good time? Have you enjoyed yourself? Have you found a perspective on these characters that you didn't have before? Or has it at least made you curious? I hope so. One thing I do try to emphasize in my work is that there is no one correct perspective or one correct analysis. We are our own filters. We shape our experiences in a hundred thousand ways that we aren't even conscious of. That is why we need other people. We need other perspectives. We need to see the world through the eyes of other minds. Which is the power of the essay. When we're not writing them for school, for restrictive prompts on subjects we don't care about to earn grades that will never actually matter, the essay is a wonderful way to share your mind, to let someone else into your world for a second. Certainly, that's what I have enjoyed about this project. I would never have thought of Spamton like that. I don't think I ever noticed Princess Zelda's boots in Twilight Princess, and I doubt that before this I would even have given Rapska much of a second thought. But I will now. I won't be able to help it. So, once again, if you have found some joy in the work of our essayists, do stop by their channels to say hi. Give them a subscription, watch some of the other stuff they do. Who knows? You might even find a new favorite channel. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. You can support me on Patreon if you want to, or on Coffee with a tip. You can head on over to my Twitch channel and subscribe there instead if you want to watch my streams and VODs. You don't have to, though. I'm just glad that you've watched this video through to the end. Be kind to one another. Have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourself. 
And may the tides of history wash gently over us all. Oh.